Hi, I'm William Gillis. Uh, I am the coordinating director of the Center for Stateless Society. Uh, I also am currently um, guest editor of the journal Anarcho Transhuman, uh, a journal of uh, possibility and striving. And I, I, I do a lot of activist work and I've, I am involved in other projects and stuff in Long West. But yeah. Anarchism is a philosophy of freedom. It's the philosophy of uh, abolishing power relations and domination and constriction, limitation of one's agency. So I think that anarchism isn't something that we achieve, like, as, a, as we reach a point and we're like, well, that's anarchy, cool, we're done. Um, I think that anarchy is an arrow. So, and I also see anarchism or anarchy as an ethical question and less, as, less of a political question, although of course, political realities fall out of that. So, um, so I see anarchism as respecting agency, uh, helping people's agency flourish, their freedom, their capacity to engage with the world, etc. And those things uh, are deeply tied to political uh, consequences but those political consequences are inherently like contextual, and so there will always be uh, there will always be ask, there will always be things that are still to be stri stri still to be achieved, and um, I don't believe in ever being like oh this is good enough. Um, so yeah, so I think that so I think that we can definitely see a world without like things that look like the state in their ostensible form today, but. Uh, but I'm not. I'm not necessarily sanguine that like that's going to happen overnight, or that necessarily there, there's. It's a. It's a sure thing that we won't. That we will transcend the state. Things could get really bad. We could all die tomorrow. But um, but I think it's something worth fighting for, and I definitely think that it's within the realm of possibility, and thus it's important. Yeah. So my father was an anarchist. Uh, he got radicalized in the Korean War. Um, there was family leftists. They were anarchist-ish, um, and then he came back. And he was in the Beatniks, and so between those two things, he got radicalized, and uh, and so I grew up like under a kind of state communist activist left-wing mother and an anarchist father who had gotten together based upon their activism, and uh, and and then very quickly divorced. All things considered, uh, uh, but. It wasn't like a really big deal. It didn't really change my experiences that much. There were so many other big things in my life at that time uh, and in my family. But uh, but my dad did introduce me when I was like five or something like that. I don't I don't remember the precise date. Uh, I remember that it's tied to the fact that there was an election and my mom was super pissed at my dad for not voting. And my dad was like, all right, your mom's completely wrong. Let me tell you what's what. <laughs> so, so from the beginning, he's like, anarchy means don't rule over one another. Don't dominate one another. Um, figure out how to solve your problems in ad hoc or informal or like organic ways. And people think that means chaos and violence. It doesn't. That was enough for me to go on. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the voting matters one way or the other. So because the impact is really small, and game theoretically, it's like a ridiculous thing to try to buy into all that and try to shift things. Now. Don't get me wrong. You can have an impact upon an election, but I think it's inefficient. It's low. Uh, it's low return on value, and it tends to corrupt you. It tends to waste energy and resources. There's so many other things that we want through direct action, through building community, through building technology, through building social changes through other means. Whereas political or electoral gains tend to be really superficial and short-sighted, um, and don't tend to last, um, or they tend to waste your time and distract you and um, corrupt you. So. Transhumanism is something very similar to anarchism. Transhumanism, I would say, and anarchism go hand in hand. Uh, if anarchism is all about social freedom, uh, I would say that transhumanism is about physical freedom, material freedom. Um, so uh, having more possibility, having more things that you can do, um, and more options, more choice, more agency in life, um, that's something that we strive as anarchists to establish in a social context, um, in an interpersonal context, in a relational context with other agents, with other minds. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously there are other important aspects of freedom. Um, if you can not work very hard and get food and not have to starve, that's important. That's a freedom. Um, if you can repair your legs because your legs are broken, um, that's a freedom too. And so material, and there's more complex ways in which material freedoms and social freedoms intermesh and become indistinguishable in complex ways, but I think that both of them work together 
or both anarchism and transhumanism work together and sync together very well in fighting that. Well, so I'm, I'm interested actually in youth liberation. So for me, what's important is I'm, I'm, I'm a consequentialist, so I don't really follow the whole rights framework. I think that's very much like a construction of the state or of a legal system, and I'm more focused on ethics. So I'm focused on like, what are your values? What should you do? And so in that context, um, I think that youth liberation just falls naturally out of it. If you care about all minds, if you care about all people, um, all agents in the world, you should definitely care about youth. And I think that it's important I think that the way that youth, uh, that the oppression of, of youth, or the, the way that children are oftentimes dominated inside of family relationships, reflects and helps perpetuate the broader social structures that we have in our society. Oftentimes things like um, patriarchy, things like, um, things like racism, those things are oftentimes just, or the state itself is oftentimes justified off of a metaphor of like parental domination. We know what's best for you. And, um, and I think that even parental domination is like hugely, hugely problematic and that we should challenge a number of the constructs or a number of the social norms around that. Um, children should have more agency in who their mentors or advisors or helpers are. Um, it, I think the notion even of like the binary family is very problematic and very conducive towards isolated power um, or towards power that is, is uncontestable. Um, and I don't see the solution to that being like the state's like child services project jumps in, I think we need to build webs and networks and communities that provide agency for children, but also provide lots of or provide lots of opportunities and in the process checks upon any sort of abuse of power that adults might have hold over them. Yeah, so specifically I'm a utilitarian. Utilitarian is a subset of consequentialism. My utilitarianism is not focused on pleasure or happiness. I am promoting agency, I'm promoting freedom. So the good for me is choice. I want to maximize people's choice. And you can justify this or you can try to, there's many different ways to, 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 to explain why that value or why that good um, and to persuade people of that good. A, a short and quick, succinct uh, explanation for that is that uh, if you are asked the question, what ought be done, right? And the basic ethical question is an ought question. Um, the only thing that that question presumes, the only thing that's contained within that question is the notion of choice. You only face that question when you have a choice, when you have choice at all. Um, and nothing else is, is implied in that, in that structure besides choice. Um, but when you introduce your answer to what ought be done and you introduce something like God, well, because God says this, or because you know happiness says, you're introducing new concepts, you're introducing new ideas that are not contained within the question itself. And so there's a certain amount of arbitrariness to the new ideas that you introduce. My, my response is basically that like, what you should maximize is choice. You have a choice, maximize choice for you. And when you add, you know, that's a simple egoism, but when you add empathy and caring about people or engaging in, in the world and seeing that other people are reflections of your own agency or other instantiations of the same basic dynamic, you want to expand their freedom and choice too. And that provides you with more agency, ideally in a, in a, in a, in a world that's well networked. Um, so that's my, that's my consequentialism or my, my utilitarianism, maximize freedom. Doesn't it serve your ego to see others' equal liberty respected, though? I mean, sure, you could say that, but I don't know what an ego is. Um, I, so, so you could say that 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 my ego, that this is the standard Randian take, is that like, you know, it's my egoism to care about other people. Um, it reflects my love for them is really an expression of my own self-love. And in some sense, that's correct. If you blur your sense of identity with them, if you're like, I don't really know how much I am a different entity than they are, then yeah, you're saying the same thing. But Rand would never say that. What in so that's kind of more what I'm saying is that like the notion of the self, the boundaries of who you are, the boundaries of your ego, even its own internal construction, most of those things are fuzzy and arbitrary and they extend out in different ways. You model and mirror other people, you take in concepts from them. It's hard to, there's a, there's a certainly practical component. Our skulls are limited, you know, confine our brains, our networks of thought are, are, you know, cut off by bandwidth. But there is a sense in which our connection with other people in some sense blurs our own identity with them. And in, with, within our own selves, an ego is oftentimes, I'm attracted to like, you know, I want to make money or there's certain things or desires, but all those things are very arbitrary. So if you slice them away, what you find and you and you come down to like, oh, the good that I'm ultimately working towards is to expand freedom, possibility, agency, choice in the world, um, other people have that too. And that's something that you can quickly be like, well, I'm not the only agent. 
and if I'm really working for a result is just agency, I don't really know that I have to wrap that in an I. Now there's limitations about how much you believe that other people exist because you have epistemic limitations, you have degrees of like engagement with them that can constrain you in some, some, some significant way um, or constrain your capacity to like truly believe that that person is real and not a philo philosophical zombie that they really think internally and that, that their freedom is you know actually contingent, etc. So there are limitations and reasons why you should, and also you have access to your own knowledge, your own situation better than they, so sometimes you know you shouldn't just like off yourself the first moment it comes up to help somebody else. Um, you should really consider such a sort of sacrifice, but I think anarchism has historically been incredibly altruistic. And the reason for that um, is that we are deeply grounded around empathy. We're deeply grounded around just not maximizing my freedom, but the freedom of all. And in fact, I, I would say the canonical anarchist statement is a statement by Bakunin who said, like, the freedom of all is my freedom. You cannot differentiate between them. It's just freedom. And so I see that in a positive sense of like the possibilities, the the overall like potential, the the options, the choice within the the, the the entirety of society or the entirety of the world as being the thing that I identify with or that I try to ultimately you know maximize. Well, people can define capitalism in different ways. Uh, I would most of the time identify as being quite negative about capitalism, um, specifically. The way that the Center for a Stateless Society and the way that left market anarchists tend to phrase capitalism is we see it as structural um, power relations on a macro scale within an economy. So, and specifically a certain type of those power relations. So you have class society, you have a stratification, and you also have things like wage labor is the normalized form by which you earn your dinner. You can't like hustle, you can't like be an entrepreneur if you're like poor. You can, but it's hard. It's really, really hard to do that. You don't have options. You can't be a part of a cooperative. So, so there, there are various limitations that the current uh, capitalist, uh, the current capitalist dynamics place upon actors. It's not a, it's not a highly competitive system. And I mean competitive in the sense of like there are a lot of options or choices available to you. I do not necessarily mean competitive in the sense of like the psychological sense of like dog eat dog. I'm going to stab you all. I don't care about your good. It, you can have a you can have a competition that's in, in many senses egalitarian that's many collaborative or altruistic in the ways that you you function um, so markets are totally possible without like a sense of doggy dog or, or hostility towards one another but additionally we did we did we differentiate between markets and capitalism by saying that Markets are just any relation of, you know, exchange or some system of broad, like, limitation of property, possession, whatever, and, some, and the flow of information through revealed preference, through I actually, my subjective internal desires, which only I have access to, uh, say that I preference this over that, and it's hard for me to convey the full contingency and the full array of all of that in a meeting, in conversation, it's almost impossible to get that through, so I just have to act as an individual. Um, whereas capitalism is more than just exchange, capitalism is, capitalism is specifically systematic concentrations of capital or power, um, systematic concentrations of wealth in such a way that those, that wealth is self-compounding. Um, and so these systems of power um, grow out of control and impress certain structural constraints upon the rest of us. And that's something that we oppose broadly because we don't see that as particularly competitive, as particularly organic or responsive, or ten, uh, have a, it, it doesn't have a high tendency of conveying information, whereas price signals and free autonomous interaction convey a lot of information. Um, and one of the critiques that we have of capitalism is that it creates monolithic large organizations or capitalists who have a lot of money and are not able to effectively allocate their internal resources. They're not able to meet the demand or the desires of others. They don't want to a lot of the time and they're able to like d pull out from that. But, uh, but specifically, um, in terms of market dynamics, they can withdraw themselves from being uh, truly competitive or truly engaged within the market. Um, they can isolate themselves in, in different ways um, that the systematic uh, nature of state violence and other things, colonialism, um, uh, racism, structures that aren't necessarily just through the state itself, these systematic structures of violence um, and historical injustice, enclosures, things along those lines, bias the structures of the market um, that we have right now into something that's more like capitalism where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and you don't have many options. What role does the state play in propping up capitalism? plays a huge number of roles. So you may be interested in reading the, or I would advise people to read the essay, The Mini Monopolies by Charles Johnson. Um, 
uh, which gives a brief overview of, of um, different ways in which the state, state's violence helps create monopolistic structures within the market. Um, structures or systems that would not be monopolistic without that. So examples or systems that create large concentrations of capital where the only, within an industry, the only businesses that can operate are like huge corporations. Um, and so things along those lines are like intellectual property law, um, taxes and the tax system and the way that it's structured, tariffs upon export goods, um, and things like even subsidies to infrastructure. So if the amount that we subsidy for roads, all of us pay a tax on that, um, but the people of the corporations that do the most wear and tear on those roads actually pay far less in proportion to the damage that they do. And as a consequence, it subsidies to the tune of actually billions, um, we've, we've run the numbers on this, um, uh, significantly higher than any subsidy or any sort of like price they pay in taxes or anything else. Um, so it allows things like Walmart and, and the like to exist, um, which of course the state likes because it likes to have a clear market that it can clearly see the actors within, so it can tax them or it can get into relations with them. Um, and if the market is more diffuse and interpersonal and um, and like the the lump and proles or the working class like exchanging well themselves, all that. All that is under the table. It's hard to see. It's very, it's very obscure from the perspective of the state. And so the state wants to stop all of that. It wants to stop you from hustling, from, from braiding hair. It wants to stop you from all these things. And the systematic accumulation of all of those different influences the state has lead up to a, a, a market dynamic or a capitalism that is in the interest of the state. Um, that, that is structured similarly to the state, that empowers it with you know, large firms for warfare, for domination, things that would not emerge naturally in a free market because there wouldn't be demand to that scale. There wouldn't be, the, and, and systems of a certain size um, that there just wouldn't be in a normal free market. Um, that's not to say that you can't have abusive relationships on a decentralized, interpersonal, like one-to-one -one level, but the reality is, is that like large-scale centralization makes that even worse. So anarchism is about, on an ethical level, combating all forms of, of domination and oppression and abuse, but, uh, but specifically on the macro scale, on things like politics, capitalism is a major concern. Um, and then it also, we also have to continue that conversation in feminism and interpersonal discourse and like how do you deal, because you may have like a person that you're relating to on an economic level on a one-to-one -one basis, but that person's still fucking you over in some sense or being particularly uh, heinous. And, um, and that's the sort of thing where there are other dynamics and other cultural dynamics that can come to bear. So social capital is the accumulation of basically your standing within a social body, um, your capacity to, your, the, the degree to which people trust you, and your capacity to leverage your relationships to people. You may be better connected instead of the network. It's a huge, it's a, it's a shorthand for a huge array of things. The reason why we call it capital is because it accumulates like capital. It allows you to compound the, deg the degree of social capital that you have. Capital builds upon capital, um, and it allows you to, to, to to, a, to, to do certain things that you were not able to otherwise. Now, some people have capital in a really localized network and they can't turn that in for anything. You can't cash in your capital of making a good meme page necessarily into like amazing dollars. But what you can do is influence your friends in certain ways or have a disproportionate impact on certain things. And this is something that obviously gets incredibly tangled and complicated and hard to deal with, but it's nonetheless the case that like, um, that there are deep problems with um, certain systems that might promote the accumulation of social capital in concentrated forms. So a lot of um, anarchist communists advocate a thing called gift markets um, and their notion, ba or, or gift, gift economies, and their notion basically being that everyone should just give things, whatever. And a lot of the problems, uh, and, and not have exchanges, um, but just have like gifts and then keep that in terms of debt and reputation and things along those lines. There's varying degrees in which they structure that. So I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make too, too broad of terms. But generic to most of them is the, or is the problem that a person who builds popularity can compound that popularity and then have real material resources that advantage them in disproportionate ways. If you are better at being a popular kid, you will better, you will fare better in the collective's meeting kind of uh, situation. Or um, you will find people who bounce from house to house just leeching off of people, um, but taking advantage of the fact that they already know a bunch of people. So they continue to go from house to house, building more reputations and continue to pull in a way that other people don't have access to. So that itself is another problem that e that is very much a concern of anarchism. It's hard to address, it's complicated, it's, it's nuanced, um, but it's something that um, communists and um, and communist anarchists have a really hard time of like actually combating and they have not done a lot of research or work into like the problem of that and also 
the ways that their systems are particularly prone to that kind of runaway. The state holds back scientific progress in a huge number of ways. So, um, so one is that it has a bureaucratizing effect upon science, um, and it's hard to dis it's hard to distinguish a science and what that means in different regards. I tend to define science as a kind of radical process that. Um, compresses information and information structures, forms the patterns of the, the most universal applicability and the most fidelity, the most widest scope. Um, so I don't see it as necessarily an empirical process or a number of these things, although of course those are important subcomponents or things that fall out of that. Um, so, uh, but particularly science as we presently know it is hugely constrained by the fact that it can only take place in academia, that it's fenced in by a number of things. Many of these institutions were built in collaboration with the state or the state had a large influence upon the norms that built up in a set of our society and our communities. And of course, deeply entwined with that, number one is the, the military industrial complex and that kind of thing, um, and the, the demands of capitalism. That tends, to take cap that tends to take scientific research in the direction of engineering or making trinkets or, you know, uh, or uh, widgets, and it takes it away from the dynamic of actually exploring the roots of dynamics. And so fundamental research dies unless somebody can like sell it to the Department of Energy as being like, and then you will be able to bomb the Russians even better. Um, and those things wither or are pushed to the periphery. Um, there's, a, there's a slogan that came out of the, Man the Manhattan Project, which unfortunately hackers have adopted, um, and it's called shut up and, and, and calculate. Um, and uh, hackers now have it as shut up and program or shut up and code. Um, and shut up and calculate was used as kind of a, a weapon against um, by some of the more engineering technocrats or folks within the um, within the Manhattan Project who were who hated the leftists and the radicals and the libertines of um, the physics community or the intellectual community that were interested in like deep concepts and relations as well as application, but like other things as well. Whereas the people who were trying to suck up really hard to the state were like, no, like just have immediate results. You need immediate testable results right now. Stop having your theory go off in these directions. And of course, you know, the real theorists would be like, well, you need to like extrapolate quite a bit in your theory and then wind it around and play with it quite a bit before you get results that you can test. You have to go out there quite a bit. And sometimes that takes 30 years. Sometimes you have to get quite involved on a thing and they want immediate results. And so if you look at the academic system right now, if you look at the industries that science is embedded within, um, what scientists will constantly complain about is like one, intellectual property, which all scientists hate, but two, um, the fact that, and the constraint of patents and things that massively constrain science, but two, they, they hate the fact that they're pushed to immediate results, immediate um, sort of like payoff. They can't play with things, they can't, um, and they're pressured by that in a number of ways. Now, of course, like in a, in a free market, there would be pressures about economic payoff and things along those lines, but with greater wealth and greater diversity, you could have times to like go off on your own. Sure, maybe you push a broom, like, you know, three days of the week or something like that, but you can still have, and it would be great to have less of a like class divide between the people who engage in science or the people who have access to that material and that understanding and the average person on the street. Um, but we have a world that is intensely negative towards those kinds of pursuits that don't necessarily immediately pay off. And so this twists and distorts science and suppresses some research programs and enables others and generally just pisses off science, scientists in general. So. <laughs> okay, um, I'll come down on the side of uh, I, I I'll choose a side in that. Um, what's worth? What What's worse, primitivism or nihilism? I would I would go with nihilism. I'd say that the I I, I was a primitivist once upon a time, and I think that some of them mean that quite well. Um, but nihilism is kind of an anti-intellectual, although it's oftentimes dressed up in intensely philosophical um, pretenses. Uh, uh, rejection of thinking things through past a certain point. So you have desires, you have desires about desires, you have values and values about values and things. And what nihilism tends to do is just like cut it all off, refuse to talk about things past a certain point, um, or just say that it's it's all going to turn out. You can choose any value. You have like it, there's no there's no difference between them. They're all equally spaced or something along those lines. And they tend to do the same thing when you have like an epistemological nihilist or that kind of thing. It cuts off any sort of investigation or radical inquiry into the world. And what that means is you're basically given a free hand to arbitrarily select whatever you at base value might want. So if you are hardwired to be a sociopath, 
um, you're not gonna fight that hard wiring at all. You're not gonna overcome it. You're not gonna go in any direction. You're just gonna screw people over. Um, if you are inclined by your family or your birth or your contacts to be racist, you're gonna be like, yeah, I'll slide back into that. Um, or more frequently, the problem is rape. Um, so you get people who use nihilism as an excuse to justify horrendous behavior because, meh, you know, uh, and, um, and predatory behavior or ways are more complex. And you, they'll be like, okay, we all agree that like rape is bad, but which calling what I did abuse is, I don't really know if I want to go there. And so the, in practical effect, this is often quite negative. And, and, and also in practical effect, many of the people who call themselves nihilists today who are, you know, former anarchists who burn out, um, a lot of those folks are attracted towards anti-civ politics in a way that doesn't fit the kind of idealism or long-term uh, desires of, um, of, uh, of that primitivism had. And so a lot you will find terrorist groups like Individuals Tending Towards Savagery, ITS, um, who straight up are like, yeah, let's kill everyone on Earth, or let's kill 20 million people, or they, they tried to kill an anarchist, they, uh, they murder scientists, they... Uh, they attempted to, um, they, well, they bombed a children's hospital charity. Um, on, and not under the auspices of, like, NGOs are terrible and corrupt, which they are, but, but although, why would you bomb one? But, but specifically, they targeted it because you should not care about people that you don't know. So that's, like, pure fascism, right? That's pure, like, like tribalism, going back to your own, caring about no one beyond, em limiting empathy extremely caring only about your pack, your group, your tribe, whatever, that's nationalism. That's the pure, that's everything that is the core wrong with nationalism. Um, that that curtail, curtailment of empathy. And I think that curtailment of empathy is deeply related to the curtailment of like thinking about ethics and things along those lines. Um, so uh, it is, I'm deeply concerned with nihilism to a degree that I'm not necessarily concerned with primitivism, although many primitivists are similarly of the like, let's kill 7 billion people on the planet. Um, but some of them, I think actually have an ethos still, so at least they have that. Uh, I'm, I'm vegetarian-ish, vegan inclined. I try to, I, it's complicated because of consequentialism and utilitarianism. I don't think that our consumer choices under capitalism really have that much of an effect on an individual level, much the same way that voting doesn't have an effect. So I, I think that there's actually, in a real free market, you might be able to set up boycotts, you might be able to have an impact, but right now, Safeway will buy exactly the same amount regardless of what you buy or don't buy. They, those, the, the price signals do not get transmitted, the consumer demand does not get transmitted, and the state will prop up factory farming if it starts to decline in terms of profit. There's so many ways in which those things are insulated from actual signals. So I do try to cut meat and animal products out of my diet, but I don't... I'm not super finicky about it. I, I, believe that anim, I believe in animal liberation, not necessarily like deontological absolutist politics about the actions that you take. Because um, there's always going to be nuances and context. So, uh, In terms of what I would ask, or what I would tell other anarchists, um, it depends upon the trajectory that they're taking and where they're coming from. Um, but if I had to say something that spoke across all the schools of anarchism or all the people who call themselves anarchists and that kind of thing, I would say, like, don't give up. Um, like, things will look bad, um, and there's burnout cycles that people go through. Um, but, and the reality is, is that, like, we're not, we're not guaranteed to win in any remote way. Um, but, and things inside the scene or inside certain scenes and communities can oftentimes be really negative and really dire. But you're in this for the long haul. When you recognize the, the basic realities that all anarchists recognize, there's no retreating from that. You have to basically like give yourself a lobotomy to stop realizing the horrors of this world and the, and the ways in which things can be made better or the, the possibilities there. So um, don't try to hide from that. Like Turn into it, but recognize that you're going to face sometimes incredible obstacles and incredible difficulties with people. Uh, so specifically, because I'm director of the Center for Stateless Society, I would say read all of the C4SS. Um, we publish studies, we publish essays, we publish uh, symposiums. Um, we publish a lot of material and we host a lot of things. Um, I would also say, in particular, there's a number of books that we've helped publish or that members of the Center have published. Um, and it's a big tome and hardly anyone ever reads it, but I would very much, um, I, I, ver I very much want to stump for Kevin Carson's organization theory. Um, and a libertarian perspective, and I would also stump for his most recent book, uh, um, The uh, Desktop Regulatory State. Um, both of those things are very important books that have a lot of content, and they're a bit thick, but they're really good and worth it. So on social media, uh, like on Twitter, uh, my, my username is Reshelon, that's letter R in the word echelon, 
and uh, I write for the C4SS, and I also write for a personal blog called humaniterations.net.